and how it is now. And then I'll go straight to the science highlights. Uh, a note here, these are personal highlights. So if you watch other magic presentations, you might find it differently. This is personal preference. And I separated it in galactic, extra galactic, and the new avenue that we are exploring now, multi-messenger astronomy, and end with the conclusions and future perspectives for magic. So the magic collaboration is composed by two countries, 180 physicists, uh, 230 in total if you count the technical and administrative staff. The telescopes are located here in the La Palma, one of the Canary Islands in Spain, actually, despite being very close to Africa, the Spanish territory. So here, a nice picture of both telescopes, Magic 1, which was built in 2003, and Magic 2 in 2009. Uh, Magic has a, its characteristic a field of view 3.5 degrees. Each of these telescopes is 17 meter, uh, square meters in diameter, which amounts to uh, about 250 square meters of collecting area. One of the key characteristics of magic is that it's very fast. Uh, it can move, it can slew at about 7 degrees per second. And this is great for finding transients like GRB and to follow TOOs, for example. And another very strong point of magic is its wide energy range. It reaches from very low energies, 50 GeV, to 50 TV, and this allows magic to search for the faintest and the farthest sources. Uh, it has a nice angular resolution of 0 0.06 at, at 1 TV and 15% energy resolution also at 1 TV. Uh, so here's the performance of magic. The gray, the gray plots is the monophase when it had only one telescope. Uh, the dark gray ones is after the readout upgrade in 2008. And then the stereo phase started in 2010, and you can see the colored points here. The, then again, in 2013, it had a camera upgrade. And now these are, we ha this is the sensitivity plots we have, the performance of magic. The red one is for low zenith angles, so in between 0 and 30. And the red one, uh, sorry, the blue one is for higher zenith angles. And you can see it uh, actually gets better here, it's because for higher zenith, the collection the effective collection area actually increases for higher energies. And there's a new type of trigger called the sum trigger 2, and this allow, allows magic to go even to lower energies, about 30 GeV. So as you can see, magic uh, has, ongone, has uh, gone through a lot of improvement over the years to get where we are now, and there's still room for improvements. One, one thing that is more recent is observations under moonlight. Uh, this is very important, basically, because it increases the duty cycle of the telescope. But there are some caveats. First, what you need to do is reduce the photomultiplier gain, or you use ultraviolet pass filters. And you need the standard analysis of the Monte Carlo reconstruction does not work anymore. You need some special type of analysis. And of course, the energy threshold and the systematics increase with this. Uh, but, as you can see, the sensitivity degradation, if you are, this NSB here is night sky background. So if you are at one, you are basically observing the night sky. Uh, the night sky with no moon. And as, uh, so this is the baseline for comparison. So if you are within eight times this dark sky background, you can still observe with what's called nominal high voltage. So you don't need to reduce the photomultipliers gain. However, if the moon is brighter, then you need to reduce it, and the sensitivity degradation is in between 15% and 30%. And if you are at a full moon or a very bright moon, you have to use the UV pass filters, which basically filters all light, and you have a sensitivity degradation of about 80%, which you can see here in these plots. This is the energy threshold and the sensitivity based for different uh, night sky backgrounds. Here's the UV pass filters, and you see the sensitivity is a lot worse. So here, uh, on the y-axis, actually the higher the number, the worse the sensitivity, not the better. So as you can see, uh, here you can see up to one TV. If you use the UV pass filters, uh, sensitivity suffers a lot, but still you can reconstruct the spectrum of the Crab Nebula during a full moon, for example. So what does magic measure? It measures uh, gamma ray showers, which is basically when a, a photon comes into the atmosphere, it interacts with the uh, nucleons in the atmosphere, produces pairs. Then these pairs again 
uh, interact with the, the molecules in the atmosphere through brimstalum, uh, produce gamma rays, and then these gamma rays interact again, producing pairs, and so on and so forth, till you get a shower. This, this is what is called shower. And each of these uh, pairs here are superluminal in the air. So they produce what is called a Cherenkov emission, which is uh, a cone of blue light, much like a supersonic emission, but now it's superluminal. And this is what magic the telescopes measure. And it stores it as an image. As you can see here, this is a, a gamma-like event. This is a gamma-like event, and it forms a nice ellipse on the camera. One thing that it's very important to do is separate between what we want, which are the photons, and the hadrons, which for us is basically background. Uh, the thing is, you need to, s there are automatic procedures to do this, but you check basically if it forms a nice ellipse. The hadron shower is a lot more amorphous. It doesn't form a nice structured ellipse like this. And then, assuming you have, you have separated correctly, you would have in both telescopes an ellipse pointing uh, differently. So in a very, very simplified manner, you use the long axis of the both ellipses, the intersection of this both axis, considering both the distance to the center of the camera and the timing difference between both, both the arrival times in both telescopes, then you can reconstruct the direction of the photon. So how did TV astronomy start? Well, Cherenkov first measured in 1937 the Cherenkov radiation, what we call today Cherenkov radiation, which is the radiation from superluminal particles. And in 1953, two guys uh, actually managed to detect an air shower with a photomultiplier on the bottom of a garbage bin, if I'm not mistaken. But it wasn't until 1968 that the first telescope was built. It's Whipple. Uh, I think it's for Fred Whipple, an astronomer. It has a 10-meter telescope in Arizona. This is 1968, but it wasn't until 1989 that they detected its first source with the famous Crab Nebula, which Professor Blend Blendford already talked about. And this is 1989, the first galactic TV source. Then three years later, in 1992, uh, Whipple detected the first extra galactic TV source. And now, uh, Professor Blandford already explained what is Markarian 4 to 1, so I don't have to explain it again. It's a blazer. So this, from 68 to 92, there are two TV sources detected uh, by Whipple. And then today, other than magic, I mean, we have three VAG t uh, observatories. Veritas, which is the successor of Whipple, so in this Arizona also. Hess, which is located in Namibia. This is in the southern hemisphere. And Hawk. Hawk is not an imaging Cherenkov telescope. It uses uh, water tanks and photomultipliers inside it to detect the, the showers. And in the future, uh, in two or three years, we'll have CTA. Uh, I think on Thursday there will be a talk about CTA, if I'm not mistaken. So this combined with this three combined with magic and Whipple and the others before, now we have from two sources in 1992, we have now more than 200. This is taken from TevCat, which is the catalog of every TV sources ever uh, observed, detected till now. So in 20 years we got two, now in 30 we got more than 200. It was a huge jump in technology and in detection. So what does magic, what was magic's role and what is magic's role in all of this? So magic detected in total 60, uh, I think it's actually 62, this is a bit outdated most of which are extragalactic sources, since magic is in the northern hemisphere. But still, it picks up about 18, so 30% of the, of the sources are galactic. Of course, most of the magic catalog is what's called dark. Uh, TV observatories point to a lot of sources, but they detect a very minimal part of it. So most of the catalog is dark. It's upper limit sources we didn't detect. So let's start talking about what I think are the main results of magic, starting from the galactic, galactic sources. And if you start with galactic, you have to start with the crab, which is today the most studied TV source and the, the oldest also, and it's more or less a standard candle for uh, TV astrophysics. So magic, this is a paper from Science in 2008. Uh, what magic did was detect a pulsed emission See from the two peaks, above 25 GeV. 
And uh, I'm not a, a specialist in posters, so if I say something wrong, please correct me. This means that the polar cap model is excluded, but what is the polar cap model? The classic models of posters are divided in three. It's basically three, the polar cap, the outer gap, and the slot cap, and they are based on where the emission region is. The polar cap is very close to the neutron stars, so the, elect the electrons are accelerated here. It's very, uh, the magnetic in between the magnetic field lines is very close to the neutron star. This model predicts a super exponential cutoff at a few GeV. So when MAGIC observed uh, emission from the crab above 25 GeV, this model, this model is excluded. And you have to turn to the, out, to the models where the emission is a little bit further from the neutron star, be it the outer gap region or the slot gap region, it, which is between the polar cap and the light cylinder. These two models predict an exponential cutoff, not super exponential. So based only on this first observation, they are still OK. One thing that is common to all of these three is that the emission is due to curvature radiation. So these electrons following the, the curve of the magnetic field lines. This uh, will be important later on. So what is the history of MAGIC and the Crab Nebula? So first of all, in 2012, MAGIC Ob MAGIC observes CREB regularly. It's one of the sources that, may, that every TV observatory observes on a constant basis. So in 2012, it measured the spectrum up to 400 GV. So this, the outer gap and the slot gap model are already challenged because there should be a exponential cutoff, but there's not anymore. And then again, uh, in 2014, there was detection of the bridge emission. The bridge emission is this emission here in between the, the pulses. And this suggests that the magnetic field actually has a toroidal shape near the, night, the, the light cylinder. And then finally, here in 2016, just two years ago, MAGIC detected post-emission from the crab up to 1.5 TV. This is the highest post-emission ever detected. And this means that all our models that I mentioned before are wrong. You cannot get up to this energy with curvature radiation alone. You need something else, be it inverse Compton or other exotic models, but all, our mo all the models, at least the ones I know, the ones I know about, are, need a complete revision. We need new models of poster to account for this observation here. So moving out from the poster to the poster wind nebula region. So here there's a cartoon of what is a poster wind nebula. This dark blue here. here. This is the pulsar, and the wind from the pulsar creates a nebula outside when it uh, interacts with the material around it. And this one is it's showing how magic can detect the faintest source. This is uh, 3C58. It's, one of the highest, it's powered by one of the highest spindle pulsars known. It's about 5% of the crab pulsar. And it was observed before even by magic. Uh, Weapon and Veritas, no detection. But with the upgrades of MAGIC, the sensitivity was, uh, kept getting better. And finally, there was a detection of this 3C58, which is now the lowest, the object with the lowest VAG flux known. Uh, this is the integral above 1 TV. And this showcases how MAGIC can and will reach for the faintest sources and the farthest, which I'll talk about later on. So moving even further upwards, what about supernova remnants? So supernova remnants for galactic uh, science are very important because they are thought to accelerate cosmic rays, at least up to the knee, which is about in the PEV regions. And based on some very reasonable assumptions, for the rate of supernova, the amount of energy that is uh, transferred from kinetic to acceleration of, of uh, the particles, supernova can account for the density of cosmic rays in our galaxy. Uh, but they, the main channel of emission is pi zero decay. So if there is a pi zero decay, there's protons somewhere. And now the question is, we know that supernova remnants can accelerate uh, particles up to the knee of the cosmic ray, 3 PV, but do they? S apparently not. Cassiopeia A is one of the youngest uh, supernova remnants we know. It's only 300 years, and it's very bright. And since we know the age, 
this is a perfect opportunity to study the emission. Since just by knowing this, a lot of the free models, uh, sorry, of the free parameters can be constrained just by knowing the age of the supernovae. So MAGIC collected about 160 hours of good data, up of which about 70% were during moon time. So this shows the importance of increasing the duty cycle of the TV uh, observatories. And it measured the, the SED up to ATV, and the best fit has a cutoff at 3.5. But at this tail here, this high energy part is likely dominated by protons, not by leptons. So if you use this, you find out that the best fit proton spectrum has a cutoff at 10 TeV. So this, uh, which was widely thought to be capable of a pevatron, which is an object that accelerates protons up to the PV energies, is at least currently not a pevatron. So changing now completely the subject, what about dark matter? This is one of the also one of the key observational programs for uh, MAGIC, but how do we detect dark matter from VAG observatories? It's through indirect detection, either by annihilation of dark matter or decay. And basically the flux of photons from uh, this annihilation or decay depends on two factors. This one is particle physics, so it has nothing to do with astrophysics. It's uh, based on the models of it, the mass, uh, what type of particles annihilate or decay, the cross-section, the number. So this is basically part, uh, particle physics. And what is called the J-factor. The J-factor is a dis distribution of dark matter along the line of sight. So in this case, you need to select what targets you want to maximize both the J-factor to maximize the J-factor and have less uncertainties. And this is what this is trying to show. Uh, if you go, the, the Y-axis show the signal strength, and the, y -ax, uh, the X axis is the robustness of constraints if nothing is detected. So the highest signal strength we have is the galactic center, since we know, we believe that there were, there's most dark matter. So there's a very high J factor for there. But at the same time, the, the, the galactic center is, has a lot of astrophysical objects. So it's very contaminated. It's very hard to disentangle the emission from all the astrophysical sources from what would be a dark matter line, for example. Uh, then you could go to galaxy clusters, which are good because they are dark matter dominated. But they are a bit far, so not as close as the galactic center. They have large uncertainties on the substructure because they are extended. So usually magic cannot observe the whole cluster in one go. So sometimes you have to observe several parts of it, and the substructure plays a role in it. And you don't know what is the substructure or the feedback from the emission, uh, intra-cluster emission, and a bunch of other stuff. So the best case we have for non-uncertainties in astrophysics is dwarf galaxies. These are small satellite galaxies to the Milky Way that are believed to be basically dark matter. They are 90%, 80% dark matter. So they, are, they would be perfect targets for it, but they are very low J factor. They are close, but the emission is not very large. So we don't know exactly what the J factor is, but there's no astrophysical contamination to it since they are dark matter dominated only. But still, we can, uh, magic does something with it, and it performed the longest exposure for a single dwarf Freud's field, Segway 1. And it got uh, very robust results they made into the particle physics booklet. So here you see, this is the mass of the dark matter particle, and this is the annihilation cross-section. And different curves is for different annihilation channels. Uh, besides this, another good result comes from the Perseus cluster. Uh, this time, they were searching for decaying dark matter, not annihilating dark matter. And this is good because it's, well, Modeling shows that it's about 80% dark matter. It's reasonably close, Z point, uh, 0 0.02, the Z. Magic observed for more than 270 hours. And this now you get the mass of the dark matter particle and the, uh, half, the time of decay, the decay time here. And this, I think, is the first results for the mass above 20 TV. So let's go to where magic is strongest, which is extragalactic sources. 
So what has magic observed so far? So as uh, you saw from Professor Blanford talk, the extragalactic very high energy sky is AGNs, AGNs only, and most of it are blazers. So what so he, he told about Bialaxa SRQs, these are the dominant source of extragalactic sources for ma that magic has observed. There are a few radio galaxies, about I think three or four, but the bulk is blazers. And what can you do with, the, with these sources? You can study the extragalactic background light. Uh, I don't know if, 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 for the ones who don't know, the extragalactic background light is the integrated light from all the galaxies and reprocess it dust from the inter, uh, intergalactic medium. You can use this also to study the intergalactic magnetic field and to uh, Lorentz variance violation. And here is the same as I showed before, but just the AGNs detected by magic. In, in, uh, the, the points are just the AGNs detected by magic. And one important thing is that due to the low energy threshold of magic, you can see from the redshift distribution that magic is the only one that can actually see these objects here, very high redshift uh, AGNs. And this is important especially for this here, for the extragalactic background light. So uh, what are blazers? Uh, well, thanks to Professor Bland for talk, I, don't, I can skip this part altogether. I just want to mention that in the double bump structure of the SED, since astronomers love to classify things, they classify blazer based on where this first, the peak of the first bump is. This is called HBL if it's above 10 to the 15 hertz, IBL if it's in between 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 15, and LBL if it's lower. Uh, now, the basic difference, you already know that there are two types of blazers. So, and the basic difference between them and what they were originally separated from is from the optical spectrum. FSRQs ha have broad lines and BLX has narrow or non-existent lines. Uh, so basically the, the, main, the main model for emission of this double bump is called synchrotron self-Compton. It's when this first bump is due to synchrotron electrons uh, em emitting on a magnetic field and then the second bump is due to inverse Compton of the same, popul of the same population of photons that were, that were emitted by the electrons on the same population of electrons. So these two peaks are connected. And this, uh, and this model explains nicely the BLAC emission process. But for SRQs, it's different. It, the photon field that, upscatter, that is upscattered by the electrons probably comes from far away, from either the broadline region, the dusty torus. But uh, I'll leave this for Joe Irako's talk at 5.30, I think he will go into more detail about what are uh, FSRQs. So, uh, as I mentioned before, this is just a selection of the highest redshift bla uh, blazers detected by magic. As you can see, these two, these are the most distant TV sources ever observed. Basically, a redshift one. And this TON 599 is the new detection by blazer. Please see Joe's talk at 5.30, and he will give details about this. But the thing that makes this type of detection very hard, it's the extragalactic background light. Since the photons coming from these blazers interact with these photons and produce pair, there is a, an attenuation of the spectrum here at very high energies. And the farther the object, the, the stronger the attenuation. So if you are at around redshift 1, the attenuation goes at 100 GeV. So you need an instrument with a very low energy threshold to be able to, to actually detect these. So I'll talk about these two in more detail, and Joe will talk about TON-599. Uh, this BKS-1441, it was detected, it was published in a paper in 2015, and at that point it was the farthest objects ever, uh, that were ever detected. If you look back here, before this one, and before TON, which is the newest detection by MAGIC, the farthest one was 3C279 at 0 0.5 with a firm redshift measurement, so not uh, a lower limit. Then you jump from 0 0.5 to 0 0.9. This was a huge uh, improvement for EBL measurements, basically. So how it was, it Fermi detected it first, announced it to MAGIC, and then this is a one crab unit. 
So whenever a source is very bright, there is a, a network of observatories that warn each other. So when, when Fermi detected it, it warned MAGIC, and then MAGIC started to uh, point it at it and detected it. And now, since before we had EBL measurements up to 0 0.5 redshift, now we can extend these measurements up to Z equal, Z around 1. And uh, it was good to see that all measurements agreed with, with what we currently, we currently have. Then the other one, uh, it was a little bit later, one year later to be more exact, it was actually a gravitational lens blazer. It's this KSO0218, it's at 0 0.954, and it's believed to be lensed by a galaxy at 0 0.6. And now, uh, one year later, we got another object which is now the farthest source ever seen in VAG. So Fermi detected a flare here. Okay, sorry. First of all, I have to say that this was already observed in radio. And due to the variability of radio, they could measure the delay due to the gravitational lensing to be of 10, between 10 and 12 days. So then, when Fermi detected the flare of this blazer, magic, uh, it warned magic. Unfortunately, this, was, this period here was a full moon, so magic couldn't observe the leading image. But 11 days after, it observed the trailing image. As you can see, this is about 11 days, this distance here. Uh, and again, you can use this to place constraints on the EBL. And again, we're, all the models that we have, are uh, these the results are all in agreement with the models of EBL uh, we have today. And this hints also into an important characteristic of uh, blazers and AGNs in general, variability. In this case, I don't know if you can see the y-axis. This is about a day, this uh, gray shaded area here. So variability in blazers can be very extreme, as Professor Blanford mentioned. And MAGIC has seen a lot of variability for every kind of source, every type of source. I just give you some examples. The most extreme is Markarian 501 in 2005, I think. There was a doubling, there was variability here. You can see a huge flare. And the doubling time is about two minutes. And you can use this to constrain the size of the meeting region. So in this case, the lowest the doubling time, the smallest the emitting region. And these are other examples. I think, Joe, if you want a more in-depth explanation on how you can calculate the emitting region from the variability, uh, again, see Joe's talk. So I'll talk specifically about this, because these two are blazers. So explaining variability from blazers, it's easier than for radio galaxies, which is what IC310 is. So uh, in, back in 2014, MAGIC saw this huge flare. It has a doubling time of almost five minutes. And this means that emission, the emitting region is very, very compact. And what happens is this variability is very hard to explain for radio galaxies because the jet is misaligned. It's not pointing directly to you. So if you look here at this graph, this shows the Doppler factor and the viewing angle. So you can use the viewing angle to determine the Doppler factor and vice versa. From VLBY measurements, radio measurements, the, the angle is constrained to be in between 10 and 20. The problem is from uh, the VAG measurements, the Doppler factor is higher than what it should be. So the angles is smaller. So this IC310, is, it should be, from VAG measurements, a blazer and not a radio galaxy. As you can see here, it, the spectrum extends up to 10 TV, and this is a way to constrain the, the viewing angle and the Doppler factor through the gamma-gamma absorption. So, so what is going on here? We don't know. One possible explanation is a pulsar-like explanation. But instead of a neutron star, you have a rotating black hole. It, this is basically the polar gap model for pulsars, but instead of a neutron star, there's a rotating black hole with an ergosphere here. The ergosphere is the blue part. So the, the acceleration occurs in the gaps of the mag magnetospheric field here, the magnetic field lines, very near the, the, the base of the jet. And the other one, this is NGC, another one that we saw a huge flare for a radio galaxy that has the same problem as the IC310 is NGC 1275. Uh, 
So there was a, a huge flare again, up to 1.5 crab units in the New Year's Eve of 2016. So the shifters there and on site actually saw fireworks on that day. This time the variability is less extreme, it's about 10 hours. But again, the same problem arises. The viewing angle measured from VAG does not agree with the viewing angle match, uh, measured in radio. So again, there should, there, the same explanation works for both uh, IC310 and NGC 1275. Uh, but here I talked about low time scale variability, hours, minutes. What about long time scale variability, years? How does the, the blazers change state? Well, for that, you need long campaigns and multi wavelength campaigns. And Magic has some, uh, some agreements with other observatories to observe a few, two blazers actually that they observe constantly every year. This is Markarian 421 and Markarian 501. So in this case, you can actually see how the source evolve in the time scale of years and not flares. You can see the emission, how the emission changed over time. And here, this is just one result. There are several papers on Markarian 521 and 501 uh, from ev basically every multi-wavelength campaign. But this is just a nice view of how the emission changes with the state. Uh, this is 2010 when Markarian 21 flared, and this is 2013 when it was measured in a very, very low state. You see the gray points here? This is what a typical state of Markarian would be. So you can see when it flares, the peak moves to higher energies, and both the X ray and the VAG spectrum are harder. Uh, the variability is higher also at X ray and VAG, and they are comparable. So uh, the variability at X-rays and VAG are comparable. That's what I mean. So back, but then in 2013, both X-ray and VAG spectra softened. And this means that the peak moved to lower energy. So Markarian 421, which is, was always considered to be an HBL, could be moving to an IBL. This suggests at least that this classification of HBL, LBL, and IBL is not an intrinsic, due to an intrinsic emission of the source, but could be a temporal state. And this is, uh, there's more evidence to this. It's for Markarian 501 in 2012. This is one of the latest results. Uh, this is a campaign from March to June of 2012 from several observatories. I'm here just uh, this is just a light curve from MAGIC, Ver the VAG light curve, MAGIC, Veritas, in fact, and this is the optical polarization ang uh, angle and degree. So in this epoch, from March to June, there is one big flare, but there's also a lowish state for uh, Markarian 421, 501, sorry. And the key point is that at this point, the peak, the synchrotron peak, is always around 30 keV. This puts Markarian 501 in what we call extreme blazers. It's blazers where the first peak is above, is on the hard X-ray range. And at the same time, if you watch the whole campaign, the VAG spectral index did not change very much. But still, it's harder than the typical VAG spectral index, which is measured from 2007 to 2009. So again, this, this characterization, this classification of blazers into IBLs based on the, on, the, on the frequency of the first peak might be just a temporal state and not an intrinsic emission of the source. So moving to a completely different topic, what about GRBs? Does MAGIC observe them? Well, GRBs is one of the key programs of MAGIC. There's more than 50 hours per year devoted just to following GRBs. MAGIC, this is the GCN, MAGIC receive alerts for, from four GRBs by SWIFT or by Fermi through the GCN. Uh, so far, MAGIC has followed up on 97 GRBs, of which 35, 37 has, uh, have redshift. And in this case, what I said before, that MAGIC's slewing speed is a huge bonus. You, practically, you can observe 
uh, there are 22 uh, GRBs observed with less than 100 second delay. So you don't get just the afterglow. You can get also the emission from the peak too. But unfortunately, so far, no firm detection. Only upper limits. Uh, and then moving to the final part of the talk, and the, well, the most exciting now since after this morning's lecture of the neutrino and blazer correction, connection, it's magic enter now the multi-messenger area. It has agreements with both, uh, it's part of the gamma ray follow-up program with IceCube, so whenever IceCube uh, detects a neutrino alert from, astrophys from astrophysical origin, it alerts MAGIC and other observatories, and they go to observe. And this is since 2012. And it also has an MOU, MOU with LIGO Virgo since 2014 to follow up on gravitational wave events. So I'll start with the gravitational waves, since the, so far nothing has seen. And I would just mention the first gravitational wave follow-up. This is a pioneer effort. It was the first follow-up of IACT for a gravitational wave event. This is back to 2015. Um, there are some challenges to be overcome when we're talking about gravitational waves. There are no specific coordinates for the emission. As you can see here in the map, this is a map of the most probable locations. But the field of view of magic is very small. So when, you, when there is a gravitational wave alert, uh, as of now, you have to select the region you want to observe by hand. Uh, and so at, at, there is an automatic procedure in the making, but I think it will take some time. So in this specific event, uh, four 2.5 by 2.5 regions were selected based on probable counterparts from uh, other catalogs. So here, uh, this region and these are the four pointings of magic. Again, no significant emission. But this will improve. I think LIGO will start 03 uh, next year. So this has a chance of improving. But what about neutrinos? Well, this is the most interesting part and in the, the most recent breakthrough result. So uh, there are more than 30 hours since the last period of observation invest, invest, invested in the neutrino follow-up. And this shows a map of the neutrino events of IceCube and the, magic, the ones that magic followed are the ones uh, circled in, uh, in the red circle. And this is the, one, the very important one. So in September 22, last year, uh, there was a GCN notice by IceCube saying that they detected an astrophysical neutrino and giving the coordinates 43 seconds after the trigger. They refined these coordinates later, about four hours later. Uh, the most probable energy of this neutrino, assuming this spectrum, is about 290 TeV. And the probability of astrophysical origin is 56.6. But at the same time, near the time of the alert, of this alert, there was no excess neutrinos from that region. Uh, but they reran some analysis from back from archival uh, events from IceCube, and there could be a hint of uh, another neutrino coming from that region. And the most interesting thing is this. This location is actually six arc minutes distant from a known blazer, a Fermi blazer, TXS0506. Uh, Here's just a graph of the most probable energies of the neutrino from the science paper just published. So every single VHD in a high energy uh, telescope pointed to that direction to try to detect the blazer. First, first, to the, first of the race was Hess. It followed up only a four-hour delay, no detection. Then a little bit later came Veritas, again, a 12-hour delay, again, no detection. MAGIC actually tried to observe on September 24th, so just two days after the, the alert, but the weather was not so good, so no detection. But then Fermi pointed at it, and it found out that it was in an uh, increased state, increased uh, GV state on September 28th, and this prompted every single observatory to point at it again. But at this time, uh, with 13 hours from September 28th, from October 4th, MAGIC detected the blazer. So this 
is the first time that there was a detection of a VHE, a VHE detection of a blazer in the error circle of a neutrino event. So you can see here, this is the error circle of the neutrino event, which is very large compared to what uh, MAGIC and Fermi is. But, uh, so this is the multi-wavelength set, so then again, there was a huge campaign, a multi-wavelength campaign to observe the, this TXS. And it's a bit lack, and as you can see, the peak here is not, on the, is not an HBL, so it's an IBL or LBL. This is one of the few of those kind observed in VAG. VAG is basically uh, HBL, so uh, objects where the peak, the synchrotron peak is at high energies. And it has a, a redshift. This is not from optical spectrum. This is a redshift measured from constraints of the EBL and the absorption here of the very high energy. Uh, you can already see here that there's a huge difference between the Fermi spectrum here in green and the magic spectrum in red. The magic spectrum is a lot steeper than the Fermi spectrum. This is something to, just to take into account. But uh, what we need to do is calculate how probable is it that the neutrino actually came from the blazer and it's not just a coincidence that we observed it. So what we, uh, so basically build Monte Carlo simulations from uh, neutrino events then you check if these neutrino events are within, uh, there you check if there's a Fermilat blazer flaring within the error circle of the neutrino event. And then you do a likelihood ratio test. It's very simple. The no hypothesis, there's no correlation. And then the signal hypothesis is that the neutrino originated from the source. Uh, you actually need a model for how the neutrinos are produced to uh, assess this. And so, uh, magic cons the, the collaboration considered three basic models. One is that the, the first is that the neutrino flux is proportional to the high energy gamma ray flux. This is between one and 100 GV, basically the Fermi band. Uh, this is motivated by the fact that only bright and hard sources in the high energy would emit neutrinos. The second is that the flux, the neutrino flux is correlated not to the gamma ray flux per se, but to variations of the, the gamma ray flux. And this, well, of course, you can see when a, when a blazer flares, it actually has more, it, it hardens the spectrum usually, there's more emission. And so it actually includes some dimmer sources that would not be included, uh, some dimmer sources would not emit neutrinos in this case, would emit in this case of, in case of flaring. And the last model considered is that the neutrino flux now is proportional to the very high energy gamma ray flux, so in TV range. And this is obvious because if, if blazer accelerates protons to very high energy, they produce neutrinos. Uh, this is a, okay, let me just say what are the results are. Uh, prior to I see to the, this neutrino event, there were nine public alerts. And they considered also 41 archival events since 2010, before the real-time program started. And you build a TS, just, there's just one neutrino, so it's pretty easy. This is the signal probability density function in the background. And the signal function depends, it's summed over all extragalactic Fermi sources, 200, 2000, basically. And it has here as inputs the correlation neutrino gamma correlations that I mentioned before, the acceptance of the ice cube based on the zenith angle, and the background is basically the zenith distribution of background events. And what is found is that when you run this, you can reject a, co a total coincidence at a three sigma level. So this blazer is very likely the counterpart of that uh, neutrino event. This, of course, we have just one event, so so the statistics are not very good. But if you simulate a bunch of uh, neutrino events and inject those in, in the Fermi sources, so let's f there's 41 plus nine plus the one, there's 51 events considered. And based on the how, how much the blazers are, how much the blazer contributes to the diffuse neutrino flux and the, the purity of the ice cube stream, 
you can expect out of 51 events, you expect one coincidence. So this is a, if you simulate several times uh, 51 neutrino events, but inject just one on the Fermi blazers, you will find out that when analyzing the energy flux of all those sources that have been coincident with the neutrino, about 14%, this is the energy of TXX, TXS, so this is about 14% of those sources have a flux higher than the, the blazer had when this blazer had when it was detected. So it's not absurd at all that this TXS is the likely counterpart of the neutrino. Uh, but to understand better what, is, what can be the emission of this object, magic kept following. So up to from the first day up to November 2nd, it collected 41 hours of good observations. And you can see here the light curve. It has two daily, it attacked a daily variability. There are two flares here and a low period in between. Uh, there, here is the spectrum, here for the flares and here for the lower state. The in uh, yellow for the lower state and in green for the flares. Uh, there's no spectral variability at all. The, spe the, it, the index is about minus 4 to minus 3.5. And as I mentioned, this is significant, significantly steeper than Fermi. And no spectral variability. And now the question is, can BLX produce neutrinos efficiently? And can they produce, since they produce neutrinos, can they produce cosmic rays too? Well, basically, uh, you can produce neutrinos through proton gamma interactions in the jet. However, compared to uh, flat spectrum radio quasars, BLX are disfavored because the density of the photon field is a lot lower. Remember, the jet is naked. It expands directly into a vacuum. For FSRQs, you have the broadline region or the dusty torus to, uh, for the seed photons. So if you take the energy of the neutrino, you need protons with more than 6 PV to interact with UV and soft X-ray photons. But how can you do that on BLX, where the density of the photon field is very low? Uh, well, actually, Professor Contopoulos mentioned this, the spine sheath model for the jet. So there is a, a jet itself which is faster, which is moving faster than the sheath around it. And in this case, on the frame of the jet, the density of photons here in the sheet is boosted. So in this way, you can actually get the density of photons necessary for producing the neutrinos. So this is the results. This is the, so you see, these are all the processes involved in, uh, in this model. So you have the leptonic process, the SSC in, in uh, the external Compton, you have the Photon pion cascade, the beta hydrogen cascade, all that Professor Blanford mentioned it before. And you can actually see for the high state, this, the, the upper uh, plot is for the high state, you can get the energy necessary for the neutrino. And this would imply a production of about 0.17 neutrino events per half year. However, in the low state, so here, this production is about 0 0.06 per half year. But if you notice, this is for fixed proton maximum energy. What happens if you change it? So this is the value for different proton maximum energy from 10 to the 14 EVs to, about to 10 to the 18 EVs. So in this case, if the, proton, the maximum energy of protons in the commoving frame goes from 10 to 14 to the 10 to the 18 to the 18, in our observer frame, you can accelerate up to 10 to the 19 electron volts. So in this very high end of the proton maximum energy, then yes. And they all, uh, forgot to mention, of course, these are, uh, the energy of the neutrino is about here. So they are all able to reproduce the, to get to the energy of the, of the neutrino event. So in this model, the jet sheath model, yes, this object can accelerate cosmic rays up to the to ultra high energy, to the PV energy. And so with this I finish. Uh, MAGIC started in 2013, so this is the 15th year anniversary of MAGIC. Uh, but still, it's not very old and still very active. There are new groups joining. Uh, we published articles monthly, basically. There are still, we can still improve the instrument. There's still uh, some there's still room for improvement. 
There's a wide variety of sources. We observe extragalactic, galactic, and now multi-messenger. Uh, magic is coming as a very strong, a big part of the multi-messenger effort. And before I finish, I just have to mention something. Now, since last year, actually, magic is accepting external proposals. So if you want to do science with magic, now, now you can. Before, it was just internal. So you can go to this site here, to this website here, to get all the details. There are tools for visibility plots, performance, uh, how to check if your source could be detected or not. But the deadline is coming. It should be about mid-October, beginning of November. So if you have a proposal that you think is strong, please contact us. Uh, go to this website. It, you have all the information there. Thank you.